Good morning and a very warm welcome to this uh, online EPC policy dialogue on the EU's responses to refugee flows from Ukraine. It's a pleasure to be joined by many of you this morning. Uh, we have, I believe, over around 200 people connected. Let me start by saying that our discussion is public and that it will also be recorded. We are meeting, as everyone is well aware of, in the aftermath of yesterday's GHA Council meeting, in which member states unanimously agreed to activate the temporary protection directive. A decision that was broadly welcomed by EU institutions, by civil society uh, organizations and many other stakeholders, and also dubbed by many as historic and unprecedented. Rightly so, uh, not only does this decision activate for the first time ever, an instrument that is over two decades old and had already been declared for once by the new pact. In the context of activating it, EU institutions and member states are also explicitly endorsing the right of Ukrainian refugees, in addition to the general rights to free movement for 90 days, which they already enjoy, to travel to the member state of their choice to apply for or enjoy the rights connected to their temporary protection status. This, as at least one expert has called it, is no less than a Copernican revolution in the context of the EU's migration policies. Nevertheless, many questions surround the Temporary Protection Directive. Amongst others, a lot remains still to be clarified on how exactly it will be operationalized, for instance, in relation to identification and registration processes. Questions also surround its personal scope, as different provisions may be applied in relation to Ukrainians compared to third country nationals, including long-term third country nationals who are unable to show that they cannot return to their country of origin or region in a safe and durable way. Also, in spite of the dubbed Copernican revolution in relation to the free movement options, that is, it's not clear whether, to what extent or in what form, we might not see uh, the resurfacing of very difficult discussions around intra-EU solidarity in the form of relocations, uh, amongst others, so it's still early to say, we do not yet see onward movements to other European regions that are proportional to the size of the general arrival numbers. Our discussion is, of course, also set to move beyond the temporary protection directives, which can clearly only be uh, a part of the responses to the situation as it is currently unfolding. The European Commission has also issued guidelines on the facilitation of border crossings at the EU-Ukraine borders, um, amongst others through the uh, uh, stronger engagement of EU agencies such as Frontex, the EU AA and Europol. The role of these agencies and the general next steps to ease the situation at the borders will certainly also be uh, considered. Finally, our aim today is also to look at questions beyond the activation of the Temporary Protection Directive uh, and the guidelines on border crossings on whether we are sufficiently preparing for the longer term. How long and how much can diaspora communities or citizens generally provide support in terms of reception and how can they in turn be supported by local, national or European authorities? How can we maximally support the labor market inclusion of those fleeing as well as access to our education systems? And are we both in the long as well as in the shorter run sufficiently considering the needs and the vulnerabilities of, of, of the population fleeing at the moment, predominantly women, children and the elderly? We have and we're fortunate to have a set of excellent panelists with us to guide us through these and other questions. I want to thank all of my panelists for having joined, uh, for having accepted to join this discussion on a very short notice. Uh, we have to begin with, with us, uh, Ms. Agnieszka Kozovic. Uh, Agnieszka is the president of the board of the Polish Migration Forum, an NGO working to promote migrant rights in Poland and currently active at the border between Poland and Ukraine. We are also joined by Tineke Strik, member of the European Parliament for the Greens and professor in migration and citizenship law at Radboud University. From UNHR, we have with us Stefan Meyer, who is a senior policy officer at the UNHR representative representation for EU affairs. We'll also be hearing from Catherine Bullard, director of the European Council on Refugees and Exiles. And last but certainly not least is Jean-Louis de Brouwer, director of European Affairs at the Egmont Institute and also senior advisor here at our migration program of the EPC. Each panelist will have five minutes for their opening statements. I kindly ask them to strictly keep within the time limit so that we have enough space for a lively Q&A session with the audience. For our members of the audience, if you want to raise a question, please write it in the question and answer box. Don't hesitate to immediately 
put your questions forward as uh, they occur to you. Don't you don't necessarily need to wait for the start of the Q and A session. Uh, my colleague Helena and then myself, uh, Helena is helping me, but we will be collecting uh, questions earlier than that. With that, uh, all my household notes are finished, and I'm very happy to hand over to the first panelist, Ms. Kozovic uh, Agneska. We're very glad that you could make the time to join us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, my role in, in uh, the, this morning is to tell you what is happening on the ground, so it will be quite a spontaneous overview of what I know, or what I see here. Uh, which is, of course, a very new situation to Poland and the first humanitarian crisis that we are facing. So um, first thing I would like to say is that we are all learning kind of from day to day to, to address whatever happens. The scale of, uh, of people coming right now is about 100,000 people every day. And this is a very mixed flow uh, because we uh, also between the Ukrainians, we have people who have some connections in Poland, as, as you may know, before the war, there were about 1.5 million Ukrainians already residing in Poland, and they, in a natural way, um, basically gather their families and, and take care of the families um, as best as they can. But we also have a lot of people who do not have links and do not have connections. Um, maybe uh, it's, it's important to say that the Ukrainian community was not well established in Poland. We do have, of course, people who cope well, but a lot of Ukrainians in Poland were doing very local job with uh, understandard accommodation. So the capacity to accept uh, the folks is, um, I think, cannot be overestimated. I mean, it cannot be as we would expect in other uh, circumstances. Uh, there are many people arriving with mixed status, so foreigners of uh, refugees, uh, people in the, in the procedure, people who uh, were students, uh, people who were tourists. Uh, Americans that cross this border. So we have all kinds of people um, crossing with various status. And I think it's, a, it's a really of concern to us because a lot of responses now are being uh, designed for Ukrainians. We see a lot of non-Ukrainians and this is an issue. A separate issue maybe is a Roma community, which is also significant in Ukraine and um, requires specific, for example, accommodation solutions. So um, moving to, to what happens also within the country, we see that overwhelming majority of assistance provided right now is provided by simple people, by citizens. So response now is really citizens-based, grassroots organizations, ad hoc organized movements, Facebook groups that, that combine efforts to provide transport, food, water, medical help, um, and accommodation. What bothers me is that this is a system that's super spontaneous and generous, but it's kind of from common sense perspective, it will be short term. And it also, um, it has many faults linked to security. COVID is a forgotten issue. Right? So no tests, no nothing, no topic. Um, an important thing I think is also um, political aspect of what we are having because the, uh, this is not a coincidence that the, the simple people are responding to what happens uh, because we still, even though we are united and a lot of people really do everything that they can, we are still a very politically divided country and society. So cooperation between state and local authorities and the local authorities and NGOs doesn't go smoothly. We don't have you know, established network, friendships, links, platforms for dialogue and, and cooperation. And this is a huge challenge right now because cooperation is necessary and they have to do things together. Um, uh, but there is no tradition, ways, tools, and means to, to do it quickly and effectively. So wherever the cities were, were before had some competence in, or experience in working with NGOs, this works. But where you have to build it from the scratch, I know it's quite natural, it takes much more time. A day before the war, the government uh, announced that they have about 300,000 uh, places for people in, in uh, accommodation that was identified by various bodies. So um, considering we have probably closer to 700 people, uh, this gives us a number of people that stay somewhere else, either in private accommodation or um, in a non-regular uh, way, I don't know, for example, in railway stations. Um, maybe I would also like to mention uh, kind of capacity-wise, in Poland, before the, the Ukrainian war, 
uh, we had maybe 30 or maybe 40 organizations that were specialized in working with migrants. And the total number of people that have some knowledge or competence in working with migrants maybe is 100 persons. And addressing this situation right now, what we really are doing and have to do is to very quickly uh, educate ourselves and, and prepare staff and thinking more long term when, for example, Mary mentioned uh, education or access to the labor market. The system that was not constructed in Poland of refugee integration, of capacity to, to, to create inclusive societies, this will, we have to catch up in warlike conditions. So this is, I think, the, the huge challenge. And I know my minutes are done. So thank you very much. Thanks to you. Again, thanks for joining in a very rich uh, account from what is happening on the ground that will uh, certainly also help us in, 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 in the further shape of our discussion. Also, thank you for reminding us of, of uh, the need to look at the longer term and, and not only the, the short term. Happy to move over to uh, Tineke for her intervention. The floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Marie. And also thanks for organizing this on such a short notice. I think everyone is really exciting and uh, excited and wanting to know what exactly is uh, is going on and what the impact is and and uh, i completely concur with you with your remark saying that this is kind of revolutionary i mean only one and a half year ago the commission proposed to withdraw this proposal uh, this directive because it would nevertheless you know not be used by the member states we of course called for it to use it uh, when the Syria war broke out, when the Afghanistan war broke out, but then the, the message was completely different, like uh, we don't want to create a pull factor and um, uh, we want to host uh, refugees in the region. But of course, many people have already said this is the region, so in, in that sense, it makes sense that now this response has been uh, made. But I'm still a little bit surprised that it's so quickly and that it's so united um, and that, um, well, it is a bit more uh, extensive than I um, was afraid that it would be, actually, to be honest. We still need to study, of course, on exactly, you know, what it means for different groups. But what I see now is that it's... Um, uh, well, that is good that it's not only applicable to Ukrainian citizens, but also to beneficiaries of international protection um, and um, also including the, the ones who had a national protection status uh, under Ukrainian law and that also family reunification uh, applies to them uh, as well, regardless if they can uh, return to their country or not. So this is this is really a positive uh, 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 element of the scope. Um, the worrying element, of course, is that um, uh, people, um, um, well, migrants residing legally uh, in Ukraine um, and cannot, uh, um, that there's a make clause, let me say, for uh, uh, migrants residing legally in Ukraine and cannot return to their uh, region. So this is uh, actually the, the ones with a, a permanent uh, resident status. For instance, um, you know, if you, if you live there for let's say 10 years or whatever, and, and you are really integrated there, it is a very hard um, uh, issue that, that you, you, you could be referred to a region uh, where you have never lived before, for instance, uh, because of the war in Ukraine and that you're not being included in this scope. I think that should definitely, uh, well, we, we should definitely try to encompass them as well in this, uh, in, in this uh, uh, scope. Um, of course, the May clause, it is possible for member states to do so, but that, that depends on the, on the political will of a member state. Um, and also, if you think of asylum seekers, so who were not yet given this international protection status, they also may enter into a kind of legal limbo system because um, in the end, uh, at a certain moment, their asylum request then has to be assessed uh, uh, for a second time, I guess, uh, in an EU member state to see if they can be returned to a country uh, or even also here region uh, of origin uh, in a safe way. And if I then think where the, of the, the places of arrival, where they, um, 
will will maybe force to 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 ask for uh, protection again. And if I think of Poland and and Hungary, for instance, I mean, and Hungary, yeah, th there was no asylum system actually anymore. Uh, and uh, also on the Polish law, yeah, we must really see how that will uh, uh, work out. Um, so. Um, uh, and, and of course, I will come at, at the border uh, a bit later. This is about the, the temporary protection directive. Um, I'm, 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 I'm concerned that these people are not under this uh, uh, scope. Also the students, of course, somewhere it should be assessed if they can safely return or not. And that will most probably be in the, the countries of first arrival. And I guess that also the Dublin uh, criteria will still apply to them. So it will not be easy for them to travel uh, further on. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if I saw in the, in the family, the, the temporary protection directive, uh, directive itself uh, um, uh, has a, a limited scope for family reunification. Uh, it is conditioned to uh, uh, persons who cannot, uh, who are also in need of protection and uh, who are members of the core family. Uh, if I read the proposal, at least for the council implementing decision, this is now somewhat broader because it also includes uh, uh, other relatives who live together and who are uh, wholly or mainly dependent on these uh, um, uh, on the the person uh, having this temporary protection, and um, all these uh, people are also not under the condition that they are in need of protection themselves. So I think. That is, um, this is the way I read it. I mean, it, it, it raises a lot of questions, of course, how does it relate to the temporary protection directive? We must be cautious here, I think, um, because I think it's very, very important that apart from the other uh, uh, rights like access to the labor market and education, that the right to family reunification is unconditional. Because if you think of that, you need to to, to, to live here for up to three years or even more, then it's very important that you're not compelled to live separately from your family members. Uh, so that is also becoming more clear. Also, if uh, family members are living in different member states, which member states is responsible and obliged to reunite the family members? These types of questions needs to be resolved quickly uh, I would also urge the Commission to come up with detailed guidelines to ensure that this is happening. Uh, I also am very yeah, concerned about what is happening at the border. On the one hand, people who are withheld back because of, well, maybe their, uh, their color skin or if they are migrants, if they are uh, especially from African descent, um, if, if we have sufficient control to make sure that everyone is really having access to the territory of the EU, um, and also that we take care of the vulnerable uh, refugees, uh, many single mothers with uh, children, unaccompanied minors. And uh, I think, therefore, it's also important not only to, for member states to wait until uh, people come to their country, but to really organize and facilitate uh, the travel and make sure that people have a safe route to their country uh, of destination. Um, and also that this solidarity platform will work in, in, in such a way that it puts sufficient incentives for member states to really come up with substantial pledges, because otherwise, uh, um, well, we, we have a nice instrument, but we're still depending, of course, on the political will of the national governments to really, really uh, make a substantial contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tineke, for highlighting indeed. Many questions relating to, amongst others, of rationalization that still surround the directive, and, and certainly, and not least, the personal scope. Uh, the, uh, the numbers that I've seen uh, passing is that there are uh, more than 200,000 foreign nationals caught in the Ukrainian war. Uh, so this is really certainly something that needs to be clarified uh, sooner rather than later, very urgently. I'm happy to now move over to uh, Stefan Meyer from UNHCR. This floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Marie, also from uh, our side in UNHCR for having put together this uh, EPC webinar um, today. Um, so I'll start with a few general remarks on the situation uh, in Ukraine and in neighboring countries and then uh, make a few comments on the temporary protection directive. So um, 
We are following with uh, uh, great concern the, the military escalation we see uh, unfolding the dramatically deteriorating humanitarian situation inside Ukraine, uh, along uh, with a uh, refugee crisis of uh, a very rapidly growing proportion. So inside Ukraine, um, the, the military escalation has resulted in massive uh, loss of life, uh, injuries, mass movement of the civilian population throughout the country, uh, the public service provision, water, electricity, et cetera, is crumbling. Uh, people's access to healthcare is limited uh, by insecurity. Uh, in terms of uh, figures, uh, at least one million uh, persons have been newly displaced inside Ukraine. Um, and over the next few months, more than 6.7 million people may uh, become internally displaced according to um, estimates. Uh, now, our staff in Ukraine, uh, 115 colleagues uh, and other humanitarians uh, are working where and when they can in uh, frightening uh, conditions. We have uh, pre-positioned stocks of relief items in various uh, loca locations. We were able to deliver uh, mats, blankets, uh, relief items, um, uh, trucks uh, with humanitarian eight um, carrying kitchen sets and, and jerry cans. Um, however, uh, uh, sec uh, secu uh, security, uh, the uh, difficult humanitarian access are major challenges for us now. Well, now, uh, when we look um, to countries neighboring uh, Ukraine, uh, more than one million people have fled uh, Ukraine in the space of just one uh, week. Uh, the majority of these uh, refugees are women, children, um, older uh, persons. Uh, and as uh, this situation continues to escalate, uh, an estimated 4 million uh, people may flee Ukraine in the coming weeks uh, and months. Um, uh, all uh, neighboring countries have uh, commendably so kept their borders open for refugees fleeing uh, Ukraine. Uh, most have fled to, to Poland. Uh, more than 50%. Um, so as of uh, yesterday, uh, 548,000 uh, refugees having arrived to Poland. Uh, Hungary, 12%, 133,000 uh, refugees. Uh, Moldova, 9%. Slovakia, 7%. Um, and Romania, close to 5% per, uh, of uh, refugees having fled there. Uh, while others, 8%, uh, have moved towards various other uh, European uh, countries. Now, the national authorities are assuming uh, responsibility for the registration, the reception, uh, the accommodation, and the protection of these refugees. Um, UNICEA has a, a long standing presence in the region um, and is supporting uh, uh, with more than 100 colleagues uh, in preparing warehouses for core uh, relief items, in assessing the feasibility of cash distributions to those in need, but also uh, when it comes to the uh, dissemination of uh, information, the provision of counseling and psychosocial um, support in support of the national uh, authorities. Um, now, following this quick uh, overview, a few comments uh, from my end regarding the Temporary Protection Directive. Uh, we in UNHCR um, welcome uh, yesterday's uh, decision by uh, EU states to offer temporary protection to refugees fleeing uh, Ukraine as indeed uh, uh, nothing less than an unprecedented uh, development. Um, once implemented, it uh, will uh, provide immediate protection in the EU for uh, Ukrainians, uh, but also as has been mentioned already, um, two uh, country, third country nationals with refugee or permanent resident status uh, in uh, Ukraine. As, as Tineke also uh, mentioned, yesterday's decision also provides that member states may, uh, so may uh, offer temporary protection to third country nationals with uh, legal residents in Ukraine who are unable to return um, and to stateless persons. Um, we encourage all uh, member states to take an approach that is inclusive 
uh, and to grant these uh, groups uh, temporary protection as well. Importantly, uh, the decision taken yesterday will also facilitate the sharing of responsibility for people with temporary protection status among uh, EU uh, member states. Uh, and so against this uh, backdrop, uh, we urge uh, EU states to now swiftly implement uh, the temporary protection directive to continue to provide uh, people fleeing with much needed uh, safety and uh, protection. Many uh, states have already shown uh, great uh, support and uh, yesterday's uh, decision um, consolidates these uh, important demonstrations of solidarity, which we hope uh, will continue. Um, it also introduces a new dimension, a new dimension to the ongoing debate on asylum and responsibility sharing. Uh, the Ukraine refugee situation and the EU's response um, highlight that the EU can uh, welcome refugees in an orderly way in a way that works uh, both for uh, people in need uh, and uh, for states. Um, and we do hope uh, this will provide momentum for uh, further reform, including uh, the finalization and the implementation of the draft uh, pact on, on migration and asylum. And when it comes to the uh, guidance, uh, Marie, that you had mentioned at the beginning, the commission guidance um, of, um, uh, two days ago, we have we also welcome this guidance, um, uh, which encourages uh, states to be uh, more flexible uh, in relation to border controls. Uh, the guidance suggests uh, measures to decongest uh, borders, and we very much encourage member states to follow uh, this helpful guidance in these uh, unprecedented uh, times. Um, so in a nutshell, we continue to advocate to member states to keep uh, borders open, to maintain uh, the solidarity with refugees that we have seen recently, uh, and to ensure uh, solidarity across member states. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, there's an echo. Echo. If you, if you, yeah, thank you, Stefan. Thanks very much for enlightening us uh, further about the important work that UNHR is doing. Uh, also very helpful to, to receive the, the background information and the numbers from you and from UNHR generally. I think that has been uh, a big help for many in the past days as, as uh, it's sometimes difficult to navigate uh, the, the, the finding the correct information. I am moving over now to Catherine Bullard from ECRI. Catherine Grosers. And um, thank you very much. In this short uh, first intervention, I'm going to cover two points, our assessment of the response so far on the European side, and our recommendations as to how that can be improved in the short and longer term. So the first point, assessing the response so far. Our assessment is that the response so far is largely positive, and it's positive in the face of what is, of course, a, an alarming and dramatic situation um, with record levels of displacement given the short uh, shortness of the time period in which such a large number of people have been displaced. If we look at the response of European states, um, decisions on policies and decisions on practical matters have been um, largely uh, accepting an offering of protection. We've also seen civil society, including ECRA's member organizations in the countries most affected, mobilizing rapidly in order to provide support on the humanitarian side, but also in order to provide support in terms of legal advice, for instance, um, and, and in terms of advocacy, um, as well as direct support for people arriving. And of course, we've seen this um, wave of uh, support and generosity from ordinary people in a large number of countries, um, which of course is not uh, unconnected to the political reaction being um, more positive um, that, than is sometimes the case. I would also note um, that we are seeing a, a, an a impressive response from Ukrainian people themselves, both in the country and in the diaspora, um, with a level of organization which is quite um, stunning. 
um, in terms of raising money, in terms of going into the country, rescuing people, providing legal advice, supporting people arriving. Um, and um, of course, as in any displacement crisis, those most affected um, should be prominent. Um, and I, I note my own Ukrainian colleague who is working night and day in um, an extraordinary way. Um, in, when we look at EU level support, this has also been largely positive. We strongly support the triggering of the TPD. We campaigned for this um, as soon as the events developed and we've argued for it to have been triggered in previous crises, a massive lost opportunity in the face of previous displacement crises. I would also note that the content of the decisions drafted by the Commission and the guidelines drafted by the Commission are largely positive, almost as good um, as can be. The unfortunate limitation in the scope of the TPD, of course, came from member states, um, but nonetheless, it, it remains um, quite encompassing. Nonetheless, there are challenges in the response. There are challenges in terms of access at borders, just practical challenges. And of course, uh, in terms of treatment of third country nationals. Um, I would note though, that some of the coverage of that issue may be counterproductive and actually provoking member states. Um, excuse me, I'm just uh, turning off alerts that were coming in my headsets. Um, the, the largest challenge I think is the the sheer unpredictability of events, given um, the very irrational stance being taken by Russia and uh, Vladimir Putin. There was an earlier phase where there were still attempts made to construct justifications that fitted within international law, for instance, based on the supposed violation of human rights in separatist areas, which leads to a justification of self-determination. All of that has been dispensed with and what we're seeing now are really um, these quite strange historical justifications and um, not that the previous justifications were valid, of course, but and there's a change in terms of the rhetoric and the approach, which makes the situation highly volatile, also in terms of, um, um, of, uh, 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 of understanding how this is going to play out in operational terms. And I would say that an emerging challenge is going to be in coordination of relief efforts. So the switch from the short term response to a long term structured response for these large numbers of people who've arrived. And um, let me conclude with my second point, which is on recommendations in improving the response. Of course, humanitarian assistance to Ukraine is uh, primordial, is absolutely crucial. And that should also be accompanied by underlining of the importance of international humanitarian law. Um, and with particular regard to the protection and the position of civilians in conflict zones. It's not Europe that's going to influence Russia on that, but there are other states that do still have contact and uh, have an interest in defending um, international law and indeed could be doing more, for instance, not abstaining on uh, Security Council resolutions. Um, and funding immediate call is for $550 million, but that will, of course, be increasing by the day of the agencies that are already to mobilize um, or already mobilized. Um, and then in addition to that, we see things like humanitarian corridors, which actually necessitate negotiations, even though those take place with red lines. I think any kind of dialogue is important as a peace building effort. Um, even, and dialogue has to be with the enemy, no? Otherwise um, you don't make peace. Um, and then in terms of the EU response, as well as the TPD, we're recommending at the member state level, reception capacity and extra preparations on the reception and protection system level. But we're also recommending mobilization immediately of integration measures, which should always be in place from day one. And um, this is not going to end anytime soon and member states um, need to be looking there as well. In terms of, um, they should also be implementing the very good guidelines that the commission has produced 
on loosening restrictions at the borders, um, which as with uh, UNHCR, Stefan mentioned, we strongly support. Um, AMIF funding can be mobilized immediately. The emergency elements of AMIF that can go into reception asylum systems, but also integration um, where we don't usually see emergency funding for integration, but with the TPD triggered, um, that is the case. Asylum agency EUAA, support and deployment. We urge member states to request the operations of the agency. We've seen in Lithuania and Latvia that it can deploy extremely rapidly. Um, and if we look at certain countries that are managing to find capacity that we didn't know they had, um, uh, there are other countries which are already and are likely to struggle. And I would note, for instance, the situation in Romania, where there are 51,000 people who've arrived. Um, Solidarity, responsibility sharing from other member states in terms of accepting people when that's the right thing, otherwise funding, humanitarian assistance into Ukraine, but also into Moldova, where 100,000 people have arrived in one of Europe's poorest countries, which is attempting to remain neutral in this because of its own internal divisions um, and questions. And above all, I think the, the EU um, ensuring support, coordination and unity among the member states. We've seen a collective security response. We need a collective response on the displacement issue. Any kind of panic or disunity will play into the hands of Putin. Um, and we know that migration is a geostrategic question, not just a humanitarian question. Final, final point, I can see Marie trying to jump in. Um, something that is sometimes been overlooked is the situation in Russia. Um, we also need measures to support safe passage and asylum for people who leave from Russia or Russians in Ukraine. There are defectors, there are conscientious objectors, there are opponents of the conflict. Um, and global, globally, political responses also need um, to come from other states. There are lessons for the long term. The double standards question is clear. Um, the problems of the strategy of externalization, instead of building up asylum systems, integration measures, um, is also clear. It's clear that the EU can manage when the decision is made to manage displacement and the arrival of people. I think most of the reforms of EU asylum law that are on the table go in exactly the wrong direction, and that is demonstrated by these current events. Um, and there needs to be more focus on the causes of displacement that lie in Europe. Arms exports, yes, but also complicity in kleptocracy and high level corruption. Um, it may not be the time right now to go into the long term questions. We're looking at immediate response. Thank you very much, Catherine, for a very rich intervention, including a number of immediate recommendations that, uh, and, and uh, points of action for the here and now. Um, over to our last, but certainly not uh, least, panelists, uh, Jean-Louis, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marie, and thank you to all colleagues uh, for their very rich and insightful contribution. Uh, when accepting to be the last one, I knew that exactly I would be confronted with the challenge that I'm confronted with, that is to say that I have to wrap up this discussion within not five, but even three minutes. So, I mean, I will limit myself to a few uh, limited uh, comments uh, on, on what we've heard uh, until now. Uh, it's good, Marie, indeed, to be quick on the ball, but it has its own limitation. That's what I understand from our discussion until now, is that there are still more questions than answers. I've seen a lot of good questions uh, piling up uh, in the chat chat box and in the discussion box, I'm not sure that we'll have answers to this question during the second part of our discussion uh, this morning. Uh, taking it from where Catherine left it, uh, the EU response to the situation in Ukraine was seen and is rightly seen as a watershed moment. Unprecedented decisions were taken overnight uh, and we have shown, the EU has shown a remarkable unity until now. Uh, the adoption of the temporary protection directive overnight and in a bit unexpected, exactly like the decision to finance the, we the, 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 the to weaponize uh, the Ukrainian army to finance the, 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 to, to provide uh, lethal means uh, to Ukraine to defend itself against Russia, uh, were not to be foreseen. And indeed, this is a watershed moment, and the adoption of the temporary protection is part of this watershed moment. 
So um, uh, it's, it, 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 it has to be acknowledged. Uh, this uh, being said, uh, we have to take the issues one by one. I know that a certain number of legal questions are still open and they were, st they were, they were listed by you. Also because simply many of us have not seen the final version of the decision taken by the council yesterday. But the buzzword, the key word for the time being is coordination coordination. That's of the essence. We are confronted with an e unforeseen emergency. When you look at the rationale for the Commission proposal and the different scenarios the Commission has been working in when estimating the, the sheer outflows of people that are to be accept, expected in the next few day, days or weeks, you can see that we are facing different types of crisis of a different range. And much will depend on the way the military operation will unfold. And nobody knows how this military operation operation where um, will unfold. Uh, maybe Mr. Putin, by the way. Uh, I, I totally agree with what Stefan Meyer uh, said. We should first and foremost pay attention, not first and foremost, they are not priorities, but we should not lose sight of the situation, the humanitarian situation inside Ukraine, which is absolutely dire which is absolutely dire. During the first days of uh, the invasion, I mean, all uh, humanitarian partners were stalled. I mean, they were simply trying to protect their staff workers. I mean, uh, redeploying uh, their resources from the Eastern to the Western, to the uh, Western part of the country and simply not being able to deliver because of course they were also lacking the necessary means and resources to deliver. Uh, to my understanding, Stefan, this situation has not significantly improved yet and we should first and foremost pay attention to that. We, we should not lose sight of that, of that either. There are indeed coordination issues and Agnieszka illustrated them very, very clearly as far as the reception conditions are concerned. But mind you, they are not limited to Poland. The same problem will vary with the other member states where Ukrainian are now arriving, are now landing at, with this very generous temporary protection statute, will be confronted exactly with the same situation. I mean, take the example, very simple, of a small city somewhere in Portugal, France, Germany, uh, where you have a dozen of Ukrainian families with well, children, most, most, most of them will be indeed women with children, it was said earlier, that will arrive, that will be hosted. We're going to have very soon the Easter holidays, and then the school will resume. What if these families go to the local authorities and make use of the right that they get according to the temporary protection directive to have their children admitted in the public school network. What, what are the public schools going to do? These are very down to earth questions that not only Poland in a very dramatic way, and you were right, Catherine, to mention Moldova also, will be confronted with in the very next days. It's not about weeks, it's about days. And then coordination will be of the issue. Coordination at national level, at national level between local authorities local authorities and civil society organization. And Agnieszka illustrated very clearly that it was not a deal done in Poland either. Coordination within agencies who are active or NGOs or organizations which are active inside Ukraine and outside Ukraine. Clearly, this is a challenge for the UN family. I mean, not only HR, but UNICEF and IOM, which will have to get their act together between what has happened, what is happening inside Ukraine and what is happening uh, in the neighboring uh, countries, because it's it's going to be the same people on the same route, starting from, I mean, somewhere in the Donbass and ending up in one of these little towns in one of our member states that I mentioned earlier, and their needs will have to be taken into consideration. So coordination is the best word. Money will not be a problem. When I look at all papers, there was an interesting questions about uh, the statement of the commissioner in charge of regional policy committing herself to use the regional funding to support the integration of Ukrainian refugee. I mean, when you look at all states, statements and papers issued by the Commission, money will not be the issue. I mean, they are willing to go to the margins, they are willing to go to the reserve. And so, I mean, that will never be an issue. But what is going to be an issue is the way this money is spent. And Catherine alluded, for instance, to the priority allocation that will have to be done uh, when allocating the AMIF funding. But it's only an example. Another example for, 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 for me would be the top up of humanitarian aid assistance within Ukraine. I hope and I expect that this will not be done at the expenses of other ongoing major humanitarian crises, whether it is Syria, Yemen, Myanmar, and so on and so forth. So coordination will be of the essence. Last but not least, about the future. Um, uh, 
sometimes I like to remind everybody that the Temporary Protection Directive is the child of the war in ex-Yugoslavia at the end of the 19th century. So when I read people saying war is back in Europe, aha, it was there 20 years ago. It was there 20 years ago. And that is the reason why we have now, we, we have the, we, the, the commission present and the council adopted at that time, this very generous temporary protection directive. And indeed it is reactivated activated for the first time 20 years after. One could ask us, or, ourselves, Catherine and Pineke, I mean, endless questions about why it was not triggered earlier. I think that the simple down to earth answer is that because this time the first countries of asylum are within the EU. We have no alibi of, about, about these buffer, buffer countries like Turkey, like uh, Iran, uh, like uh, like um, uh, Pakistan, for instance, as far as the, I mean, no, the people move and they land in the EU. And I, I think that it is the main reason for my own mother self, why it was so easy to move to the temporary protection. But what does it say about the future is that we might end up having been in such an exceptional situation that unfortunately, Catherine, I would like to agree with you that lessons will not be learned for the future. Because if we are again in the future confronted with a different type of crisis, with people not arriving directly uh, in the EU, not coming from our immediate neighborhood, I'm afraid that the, 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 the answer will be mm, no, maybe, well, we have to keep temporary protection. I agree with you, Tineke, that the commission will drop this stupid idea to withdraw the temporary protection directive that it mentioned uh, when, when it presented its new, 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 new package. But I'm not sure that people will remember by the time what is happening nowadays with regard to Ukraine. And I just take an example is that, uh, my, I'm, I'm, that's my last sentence. Uh, I remember uh, what, what struck me is that when you look at the press release that was issued after the JHA Council yesterday, there is indeed a paragraph mentioning that indeed in the meanwhile, the mental states keep on working on the new gradual approach proposed at the Lille Informal Council by the French presidency. And I really appreciate the efforts of the French presidency, though this track has not been lost yet, notwithstanding the the, the, indeed, I come back to what I said earlier, the watershed moment, which represents the first historical triggering of the Temporary Protection Directive. Thank you very much for your attention. Marie, over to you. Thank you very much, jean -Louis, and thank you for your very clear plea in terms of uh, uh, focusing on coordination. I think uh, everyone can subscribe to that. Uh, you also mentioned coordination in the context of AMIF, and that brings me to uh, our question and answer session. We've received many very good questions from the audience already. Uh, I'll try to bring in as much as possible, but given the sheer volume of them, I, I'm, I'm not sure if we'll manage to answer all of these. Um, but let's make a start. Uh, including on AMIF, we have a question uh, from Katharina Bamberg. Uh, highlighting the many different instruments that are available and, and uh, other funds that will be geared towards the situation. Asking our panelists as well, uh, what are your views on how uh, these uh, funds can be made easily accessible to local stakeholders such as cities and NGOs on the ground? Um, we also have a question from Laura Sullivan, who is writing uh, also in the context of the We Move Europe campaign, uh, highlighting that solidarity and human humanity being shown to Ukrainians right now is amazing, it must be the standard for all humans, um, uh, regardless of, of, of uh, color of their skin, passport or migration status. This is a chance for Europe to shine. Uh, this is a chance to start again. And how might we nudge things there? And, and this also links in with a number of other comments uh, and questions that were raised uh, by the audience, amongst others, on, on what is and can be done uh, in relation to uh, reports of discrimination at the border uh, and or uh, the double standards uh, in, in context of how refugees are treated. Um, there is a very specific question uh, also from Ari de Pater to Catherine, uh, asking her to please elaborate on your comments about uh, counterproductive uh, criticism to the uh, TPD. Um, so the, uh, if, if Catherine, if you don't mind uh, uh, coming in there, that, that would be nice. Um, starting with the first question and looking at my panelists, uh, anyone who can, talk to the ways in which we can make sure that uh, funds are made as easily accessible as possible uh, for citizens and uh, for cities and NGOs. Uh, but also please don't hesitate to come in on the other question raised. Happy to hear who would like to take the floor first. I see Tineke's hand, so please don't hesitate Tineke. Okay, yeah, maybe I can take some of the questions regarding funding. 
Um, I mean, there is a part in AMEF uh, which can also be used for, for civil society, for NGOs. And, and, and I think it would be very important to call upon the commission to make these, uh, these funds swiftly available and, and lift certain procedural requirements because normally it's, it's a very tough and uh, bureaucratic uh, system. We are also now discussing uh, if uh, the unspent funds of AMEF could also not be immediately uh, used. Uh, this is the case for structural funds, but not for AMEF. So we are now, uh, we want to know from the commission why there is this distinction, because then we could immediately have a lot of uh, funding available. And I would like to remind you also that we have in the parliament also the sensitivity at the moment for giving a lot of funding to the Hungarian and Polish authorities uh, in the framework of the rule of law regression and uh, the conditionality mechanism. In that sense, it would be uh, very important to, to really define exactly uh, where the money should go. And uh, I think in this sense also to... Um, this links in to another question on uh, what is happening at the border, the dis discrimination. Agnieszka also mentioned this uh, again in the chat, uh, that there is this discrimination on all levels, uh, both at the Ukrainian side and the Polish side. And, and I, I think it could also take place in other member states that here it might be important that agencies are really also stepping up and getting you know, also the instructions to be very, very vigilant on any discrimination and make sure that this access uh, is there for everyone. So the, in that sense, really uh, also, you know, correcting if necessary, the border authorities, if they are, uh, if they are uh, having exclusive uh, practices. And also it's, it's about um, all types of minorities. Eh? Agnesa talked about uh, uh, um, uh, Roma people, or also people with another color, but also I also heard from tr transgender people or LGBTIQ, we really must make sure that no one uh, uh, is excluded. I also saw in the chat, uh, a very important message that uh, asylum seekers and migrants are also still detained in a detention center in Ukraine and cannot be released. I think we really should make sure also if the comm commission could ex exert pressure, but also uh, I was also thinking of alarming the Council of Europe and the CPT uh, so that they enter into uh, the authorities in Ukraine to make sure that they are released. I still saw some questions about third country nationals, who is excluded and not, maybe to be very precise uh, at, for what I know, is that uh, there is this distinction between holders of a permanent residence permit and unable to return to their country of origin or origin. They have the same protection, so they have the temporary protection or adequate status under national law. So member states do have to give them the uh, at least equivalent protection. But then there's a May clause for all other uh, migrants, third country nationals residing legally in Ukraine and not being able to return to their country. So this is about um, asylum seekers, uh, students, et cetera, et cetera. And they may uh, enter into problems if they cannot access an asylum procedure, uh, a proper asylum procedure in the, in the uh, border countries. There was a, a question about when does it enter into force? I just got the message that on the Belgium website, it's already uh, made clear that uh, as of the 7th of March, uh, people can apply for temporary protection. So that I think then a reason that, uh, that they know that it will enter into force at that uh, uh, time. There was also a question, will all member states um, contribute or, or uh, apply? We don't know, of course, but it has been adopted uh, with unanimity. So I, I would hope that also from the national level, national parliaments, NGOs, et cetera, et cetera, also call upon their government to indeed then also deliver um, and keep their, their promise in, in that sense. I think, and maybe very briefly, because I think if this is a new chance, a new opportunity for a complete, you know, revi re reverse of the whole attitude of the EU regarding asylum and the whole new pact, we must do, I think, our utmost best to, to make this happen, to use this momentum indeed for another attitude showing, look, we can do it. 
the need of uh, you know a uniform uh, approach and solidarity i'm skeptical about it to be honest i mean also if you look at the border uh, member states countries how they react they make very clear this is completely different from any other refugee so I think the attitude and the culture has not changed at all yet, uh, but yeah, we must do our best and maybe we should hold another webinar uh, at the border, the middle uh, uh, long term to discuss this further, how we can uh, uh, make that uh, happen because it's very much needed. And my last, I, I fully, fully concur with Jean-Louis that coordination we also um, really urged upon the commission to take that coordinating role because otherwise it uh, i don't see any specific member states coming up with this uh, important responsibility to fill that uh, gap thank you thank you very much Tineke. i think you did an, an extremely impressive job uh, in navigating the, the different questions that we have in the chat box and, and, and talking to many of them, including the question of, of uh, the, in your last remarks of some Huckstep, what can we do or what should we expect in terms of potentially changing attitudes uh, and approaches uh, the, for migrants in a more general sense. Uh, I'm happy to see if, if uh, some of my other panelists want to come in. Catherine is uh, smiling, so over to you, Catherine. Uh, yes, thank you. So let me come in on the funding question. And I think under AMIF, there's the emergency funding um, under the AMIF instrument and ensuring that, that that goes to the relevant actors that are ready to support, um, be they local authorities, civil society, um, or governments. Um, I think there's also a question we're suggesting looking at amending the national programs um, under AMIF. This is the funding that member states receive under AMIF, where they prepare national programs on what uh, they, they intend to spend that uh, EU uh, asylum migration integration fund uh, money on. And clearly for a number of member states, the needs assessment that they had is no longer valid because the situation will have changed so hugely. And I would say what would also be very useful is actually beyond EU funding um, because however um, it is adapted, EU funding is always a co complex and not all organizations not all uh, institutions can can manage it you need a certain amount of project management financial management capacity and that cannot change that is in the financial regulation and um, so there we would look at things like regranting mechanisms but also just urging those who provide more flexible funding philanthropic foundations for instance and um, people to set up um, small, rapidly accessible grants that can go immediately to the organizations that are already active. Um, and that's both in the EU, but also in Ukraine itself, for instance. Um, but increasingly, this will be in Moldova. Um, so that, that I think there's a combination of things. Um, I, I, I would say in relation to that, that the question for Ukraine and Moldova is, is getting the humanitarian system functioning and all the different provisions there for um, and it, it, it's been so soon that 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 is not yet the case, but we assume that the humanitarian actors um, will be mobilizing in, in response to the, the, my, my comment about counter productivity. Um, so in terms of access at the border, we've, of course, been arguing that everybody has to be allowed to cross the border and, and that any type of um, discriminatory treatment, racial profiling, anything else is, is completely uh, unacceptable. And Ukraine itself is ethnically and religiously diverse, which is sometimes overlooked um, and not least by leaders who want to claim um, that it, it is uh, purely uh, sort of white and Christian. And so, among the Ukrainians fleeing, um, there are a variety of different people. And then of course, there were around 500,000 non-Ukrainian nationals who have a whole variety of different um, fates and experiences, some still in the country, some having left, some being repatriated, some not, not able to. Um, we would highlight that the guidelines produced by the commission are very useful on what should be happening at borders um, to ensure that people can cross regardless 
of who they are. Um, we, we support Tinica's suggestion that there should be monitoring to ensure um, that there isn't uh, problematic behaviour, uh, including by individual um, border guards and so on. Um, if Frontex is deployed, it's essential that fundamental rights monitors who have now been recruited are part of any kind of um, EU presence in the form of Frontex, who would have a role in, in overseeing exactly this kind of thing. Um, my comment, and it may be a controversial one, is that some of the coverage on this issue may have created the risk that it becomes a political question. And if we look at some of the responses, for instance, Austria, um, the, 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 yes, there's a real concern there, but it, it, the, the worst thing that can happen is that member states start um, highlighting this and trying to put in place um, differential treatment under protection regimes for those who are not Ukrainian. And that was part of the debate yesterday in the council, as we understood it, with certain member states having um, insisting on this limiting of scope um, for what is a small issue, an important one, but but not one that should become politicized. So that is just a note of caution. It doesn't mean that it's not an important issue. It means that there needs to be care taken that the discussion of it doesn't become counterproductive. Um, one of the main reasons why the TPD was not previously activated was because of myths about pull factors. And all of those issues become intermingled. Um, in terms of the TPD, we strongly supported it, but that was conditional on it, the content of the decision being appropriate, which in our judgment it was, despite the limitations that remains quite large. Um, and we would also highlight in the instrument itself, it's quite clear that those covered by the regime, the temporary protection regime, still have the right to ask for asylum if that's what they wish to do. Um, and members, it, um, the TPD also sets minimum standards. Member states can offer higher protection standards in terms of content and in terms of this type of status. Um, this is clear from the instrument. Some of that's highlighted in the decision. Other things are not, but they apply nonetheless. Um, and it, the whole thing is without prejudice to the implementation of the Refugee Convention. So with all of that, those measures, we, we then need to monitor and make sure that all people leaving have access to the appropriate form of protection um, for them. Thank you very much, Catherine. I see Jean-Louis also wants to come in, but I might, if Jean-Louis uh, allows me, move to Agnieszka. Uh, Catherine also talked about questions uh, relating to what can be done at the borders here and now, uh, the guidelines, etc. There are also questions to that effect in the chat. Are, are the uh, Polish border authorities implementing the guidelines and, and what more can be done to facilitate uh, easy access? And I would like to move to Agnieszka to, to maybe also add a few comments there. Yes, I think, I mean, while I myself brought up a question of coordination, I would like to refer your, your attention to implementation or quality of how this translates to the ground. And when we talk about international cooperation or, or responsibility sharing, uh, while I, I appreciate that and welcome that, I do see a lot of risks um, at the current level of how things are in practice, because we do have busloads of people departing. I have seen them half an hour ago um, to Berlin and people are being distributed pieces of paper from a you know, student notebook uh, with, with, a name, with a name Berlin written on it. And this is a ticket. So uh, I think the level of insecure or dangers are there. And, and I think we have to watch out. Also, we have a lot of people that are cr crossing borders with no documents. We are in touch, for example, of orphanages that are being evacuated and kids that have not only no ID, but not birth certificate or nothing. So there's plenty of room for, for some exploitation or pathological things happening. So I think we have to watch out for this. I also wanted to mention that there is a uh, backwards movement. So uh, with the, the Ukrainian population before the war that we had, it was predominantly men. What we now experience is uh, a movement of the men to war. And um, firstly, uh, it affects the, the quality of support that uh, potentially they could provide to families that arrive 
because what we see is a swap. We have families arriving and the men departing uh, to war. And also, I think it will have an effect, economical effect of Polish economy. And in result, on uh, public opinion or quality of life. And I think that this is also kind of an element that we that we have to consider. I would very much appeal to, to you talking on, on the commission level or directives level to, to really have a close eye how these things function on the ground or what are the practical results um, of the decisions taking high, because sometimes they are just unexpected or, or tricky. Thank you very much. Thanks to you. Charlie wants to come in. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Marie. Uh, maybe I will sound like repeating myself, but I really would like to follow up on a few things that were now just said by, amongst others, uh, Tineke uh, and uh, Catherine. Uh, I, okay, I mean, as I said earlier, means and resources, will, we shall not be short of means and resources to uh, answer this crisis. Uh, you refer also, Catherine, to the possibility of private funding. I forgot to mention in my first intervention that the EU has also activated the civil protection mechanism uh, through which uh, in-kind support is being delivered and will be delivered inside Moldova and inside uh, Ukraine. So all that is there. But what we definitely need is, again, coordination and a clear view of where the needs are. Needs assessment are of the essence. If we don't coordinate, if we don't do that on the basis of a clear needs assessment, we are going to end up in a, sorry, I mean, it might sound a little bit provocative, in an IT type situation. You know what happened in IT after the earthquake, where aid is pouring from all sides without the slightest coordination on the ground, without the slightest understanding of where the priority needs are. And this is applicable both inside Ukraine and in the receiving neighboring countries. And, what, and at the end of the day, this concentration of aid and goodwill end up being totally counterproductive. That will be of the essence in the next few uh, days and weeks. Concerning the situation uh, inside uh, Ukraine, I was struck by a remarkable show of unity, which was illustrated by a press statement issued recently by the EU and US ambassador in Geneva, together with HR and IOM, and advocating for, I mean, the protection of non-Ukrainian nationals inside Ukraine. Seemingly, both the EU and US are campaigning for that purpose, joining forces uh, with HR and IOM, but this message should be passed in no unclear term to the Ukrainians and the Ukrainian authority, notwithstanding the formidable show of support that must accompany uh, this uh, message. Uh, the two last, two last comments. One issue that we haven't raised yet, but it's part of the history of this direct. Mind you, temporary protection is under the regime of variable geometry. Denmark is not bound by what has now been adopted. Ireland is. And the irony of the history is that when the temporary protection directive was adopted in 2001, United Kingdom opted in. Uh, so we might also wish as an EU to have a conversation about United Kingdom, about their position uh, with regard to the regime which has now been put in place, because we all know that UK is also seen as a possible destination for many of the people moving, I, I, I must say I'm ignorant about the size of the Ukrainian diaspora in the United Kingdom, but there is certainly one there. So conversation might be needed. Uh, I'm still puzzled by the discrepancy between the estimated size of the outflow and the possible reception capacity in the member states. I mean, I began to be puzzled uh, looking at the warehouses and the explanatory memorandum of the commission proposal. They rely on one end on an HCR estimate, which says that in the worst case scenario, up to 4 million people might flee Ukraine. But at the same time, they acknowledge that on the basis of the information gathered by the member from some member states at the time the proposal was drafted and on the top of what the diaspora could offer the estimate number of reception places in the EU would have been 310,000 so why when and how will this gap 
be covered. I hope that it's getting narrow now. Last but not least, we're going to have to think in the future about the relationship between the temporary protection regime and I would say the classical asylum and protection instrument. That was already an issue at, at stake at the time the temporary protection directive was uh, adopted because mind you, by that time, the HCR was on the brakes because the HCR saw in this temporary protection regime a possible affaiblissement, a possible weakening of the classical international protection regime, which explains why in the temporary protection directive you show you see a lot of reference to asylum procedures and to the role that the HCR should play. We are not there yet, but I think that very soon, Catherine, we are going to be confronted is all of the member states of the consequences of non-choices that were made in the past and asking questions. It's not about new asylum seekers. It's asking questions about the difference of treatment between, for instance, Ukrainians enjoying immediate temporary protection and on the other hand, Afghans, which have still, uh, uh, whose, whose asylum and protection request is still endless to handle through endless procedures and which are offered reception condition, which are, to put it mildly, not up to the standards they should be while waiting for the decisions to be taken, the final decisions to be taken. That is something that our government will have to handle and that will not be very easy to explain to the public opinion. That could be, uh, Tineke, the kind of trigger that might need it to wake up the public opinion and maybe to end up in a somewhat less skeptical or pessimist conclusion about the future shape of things that obviously you and I shared earlier. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, thanks to you, Jeremy. Uh, you, you talked about many things, including uh, questions on how how our reception capacity is going to meet the the numbers of people arriving. To throw one more question from the audience in, into uh, the conversation here, uh, bearing in mind that we are uh, nearing almost the end of it, uh, but a question that links to what you just said. Uh, Santiago Escobar is wondering about how all of this will connect to already very known implementation problems uh, and, and unending bottlenecks in registration, but you could also add reception. What are the panelists' views on this? Uh, the, how, how should we look at those risks? I'm first going to turn to Stefan, though, who also want to come in, wants to come in uh, on some of the points either uh, previously raised on or on this new question. Stefan, the floor is yours. Uh, to Stefan and to my other panelists, please do keep your next intervention short so we don't run too much over time. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Marie. So from mine, perhaps I just wanted to 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 echo and reinforce um, the points uh, made by by my fellow panelists around the uh, preservation of protection space also beyond the, the Ukraine situation, which for us is is really uh, crucial. So to be careful and mindful um, to uh, preserve um, the protection space both in the EU and with respect to um, uh, other uh, crises, uh, including with, with respect to the mobilization of uh, funds. Uh, our, our world, as we know, is unfortunately characterized by a, a proliferation of humanitarian crises, many of which have become pro protracted due to a lack of, of progress on uh, peace uh, development, and all of which uh, require our continuous um, attention. Uh, uh, also, uh, perhaps like to seize the chance of uh, reminding all of us of the uh, uh, the situations uh, pr preceding the Ukraine crisis, the situations of violence and border uh, and human rights violations against refugees, against migrants at various uh, European uh, borders, with um, uh, credible reports of uh, ill treatment, of pushbacks. Um, um, uh, at land and at sea uh, borders, um, which, which have come uh, through uh, interviews with thousands of people um, who have uh, reported on these very disturbing uh, patterns. So uh, for us indeed, um, uh, let's uh, do hope uh, as um, uh, Tineke also and others mentioned before that this moment can be used for uh, showing that um, the EU can do better, that uh, uh, it's time to move away from the temptation of externalization narratives from attempts to uh, outsource protection responsibilities outside of the EU um, and, uh, and hopefully marshal a, a response that is uh, 
that is more protection uh, oriented. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. We're nearing or we're already at the end of our uh, dialogue. I'd be happy to hear if any of the panelists, panelists wants to make any short final remarks. Jean-Louis, Catherine would like to come in very briefly. Uh, Catherine, the floor is yours. Please do keep it brief if you can. Thanks. Yes, uh, um, thank you. I, I also just want to underline, I mean, we the, the uh, triggering of the temporary pr protection directive is extremely positive. That's our position um, and, and will remain so. Um, but two qualifications, of course, beyond this temporary protection regime um, that has been created, asylum systems as a whole still need to function. Um, we and others will continue to call out the lack of compliance and the flagrant violations of EU asylum law and international law that take place. Um, and all people arriving in Europe have to have access to an asylum procedure. And that, that remains a challenge, that remains something that people will focus on. I think it's unfortunate that so many resources have and time has been spent on trying to put in place reforms that don't actually address the problems and on measures that are based on trying to deny access to protection to those who need it, instead of getting asylum systems ready for the arrival of um, people from wherever they come um, and also on other complementary measures such as integration programs um, which also need to be ready and in many cases I think as I say there needs to be focus on this as there should have been before so that from day one people wherever they're from have a chance at inclusion um, through respect for their rights um, and then the, the final second qualification is of course yes we're saying that this is a good thing but th this is the beginning of what will be a very long drawn out complex and um, dramatic emergency situation so everything related to what we know about humanitarian response about emergency response uh, coordination monitoring implementation assessing to make sure resources are not misused etc etc all of that now has to be applied and here in europe um, as well as uh, in the neighboring countries. So I don't think while noting some, uh, let's say responses that we support, I don't think anybody is underestimating and not least um, our members, our organizations in the countries most affected um, who are, are uh, preparing for the long haul. Thank you very much, Catherine. I'm turning also to Agnieszka for a very brief final remark. <laughs> I just wanted to applaud the Polish people. So I have to say, being Polish, I'm really proud. I haven't seen anything like this in my life. And what happens and this, this um, accumulation of positive energy and, energy and helping and generosity and openness on the side of Polish people is unprecedented. So I just wanted to close with this. Thank you so much. No, thanks very much, Anieska, for giving us this uh, final note to end with. Tineke, uh, you want to also... Uh, very, very briefly, because I also, I mean, apart from um, the positive notes on Agnieszka and Catherine, which I completely concur with, I think it's indeed important that, um, you know, the whole efforts that have to be made to accommodate all these refugees, uh, that we should be aware and alert that it doesn't uh, disadvantage uh, or come at the cost of uh, protection for other people. Actually, you know, this, this whole temporary protection directive is also meant to not overburden or not, you know, uh, additionally burden the asylum system. So that's not an excuse for our countries uh, to underperform on that. So they need to keep pace on that as well. But there will be a kind of competition in the end, I think, if it comes to accommodation, uh, uh, access to services, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we should be very... Uh, uh, carefully uh, watching this. In that sense, it's really unfortunate that a AUAA, the monitoring provisions, have uh, have not yet entered into force. Um, but I also think we should make sure that you know the attention is not distracted to the real serious human rights violations at the borders. I mean, um, 
uh, of course, Greece will also need to take part in, 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 in the temporary protection directive, but it should not be an excuse whatsoever not to be vigilant at, uh, as well towards uh, the violations and make sure that, uh, that they stop and that people get access to an asylum procedure. I mean, already the commission is very not so willing <laughs> to uh, enforce this compliance, but now it's, it's up to all different stakeholders, I think, to make sure that this problem will not disappear from the table because of our attention uh, being shifted to this uh, huge um, refugee crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tineke. I want to thank all of my panelists, as well as our audience, for a very lively exchange. Uh, as Sean, we highlighted a lot of questions on the table at the moment. Uh, a lot of questions likely to remain on the table in the days to come. We'll, continuing, we'll continue monitoring uh, the developments here at EPC, and I'm sure all the other organizations represented here and in the audience will continue doing the same. And we look forward to reconnecting on these and other topics in the future. Have a nice day.